All right, thank you all for tuning in to WJHC LP 98.3 FM, your voice, your music, your station, and where change matters. So today, um, we'll basically be talking about essentially how to build multi-generational wealth. So we're actually, for those that are on Facebook, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're about to go on Instagram Live right now because we had just... Uh, a quick internet glitch so let me actually get that going um, but essentially we're talking about how to build multi-generational wealth you know so this is a very important topic that commonly gets missed especially amongst you know people that may be in my community um, I think it, it's something we don't talk about enough and it's something we really need to talk about even more you know, so let me get this fate. Let me get this Instagram live going, and we are live today on WJC LP ninety eight point three FM. Um, essentially, your voice, your music, your station, and then also where change matters. Um, so, with that being said, let me just go live on Instagram. Just had some technical, it's real technical issues getting on the first time, but. Looks like we're live on Instagram. And let me just go ahead and make sure. Okay, so. Yeah, sometimes these technology things, they act, act a little weird. But, I mean, what, <laughs> what good would life be if we didn't have any issues, right? So we'll just get that going in a second. Let me actually just skip the title part. And get right to it. Hopefully everyone is having a great evening and we are live on Instagram talking about how to build multi-generational wealth. Um, this is a, a big topic. We just got past Black History Month last month, but we'll continue um, the trend with some of these topics and just making sure that in 2021, my goal this year is for, for 2021 to be the best year possible. And if I can help in any way, then please let me know. All right, so I'm always here to help. I'm always here to support. But the only thing is, I usually only help those that are super hungry. All right, so my purpose in life is to inspire and support the super hungry to take hold of infinite resources in order to create an abundant lifestyle. So I'm only here to help. I'm only here to help you build wealth create abundance and just have just have more right have more in life I can only teach you though I can only show you I can't actually do for you that's the thing at the end of the day you have to be the one that does all right so let's talk about how to build multi-generational wealth um, as today's topic at first though Let's get into the market report. So there was a lot of crazy things happening in the stock market last week. And we'll be talking about some of those things today. Um, looks like we're live on Instagram and we're live on Facebook and WGHC 98.3. WGHC LP 98.3 FM. So let's see what happened last week in the stock market. Stocks opened last week mixed to lower. Only the Dow... 0.1% and the global Dow 0.2% were able to eke out minimal gains. The Nasdaq plunged 2.5% amid a tech sell-off. The S&P 500 fell for the fifth straight session, dropping 0.8%. And the Russell 2000 lost 0.7%. Energy surge climbing 3.5%. Right, financials, industrials, materials... Um, and real estate also gained, ultimately. All right. And then information technology, or IT for short, was down 2.7%. So there was a big tech sell-off, for whatever reason. And consumer discretionary, down 2.2%. Treasury yields jumped higher. Um, crude oil prices increased $2.45 to $61.69 per barrel. So ultimately... The stock market was down on Monday because, for one, there was a big tech sell-off. And then for two, 
people were jumping into treasuries or into bonds and things of that nature. They were sort of flip-flopping. The stock market is all about supply and demand, by the way. It's not really anything more than that. It's just supply and demand. Supply, if there's more of something, then the price goes down. If there's less of something, the price goes up. If more people want to buy something, the price goes up. If less people want to buy something, the price goes down. It's simple economics. Very, very simple. So if you see stock prices move during the day, it's simple economics. All right, so just something to keep in mind there. Large caps improved last Tuesday, lifting both the Dow and the S&P 500 to marginal 0.1% gains. The global Dow climbed 0.3%. Tech stocks fell, pulling the NASDAQ down 0.5%, while the Russell 2000 gave back 0.9%. Crude oil advanced again, while treasury yields and the dollar fell. Investors took some solace from Chairman Jerome Powell, who offered assurance that the Federal Reserve would move patiently and offer ample notice. Right, this is very important words. Offer ample notice before it begins to firm monetary policy. Among the market sectors, energy led the way, adding nearly 1.6%, only consumer discretionary. Healthcare and information technology essentially lost value. All right, so basically the stock market, um, it was mixed. It was a little mixed on Tuesday. This whole bond thing, the interest rates, that's what affected the market last Tuesday. Stocks rebounded robustly last Wednesday, following Federal um, Reserve Chair Jerome Powell and his reaffirmation that the economy in general and inflation in particular have a long way to go before reaching levels sufficient to scale back the accommodative measures currently in place. Encouraging news of an expected rollout of a new COVID-19 vaccine Right from another manufacturer, aka Johnson and Johnson, um, and shout out to Johnson and Johnson for getting that one-shot COVID-19 vaccine approved. Hopefully, it's not poison, um, but apparently they got it approved by the, you know, by the FDA, and basically it helped drive the benchmark indexes higher. Right. And then the Russell 2000 climbed 2.4%, followed by the Dow 1.4%, and the S&P 500 1.1%. The NASDAQ 1%, global Dow 0.8%. 10-year Treasury yields advanced, as did crude oil prices, while soared, which soared to 63.33 per barrel. The dollar was generally mixed. So Wednesday, it was a decent day. The Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell came out and said some good stuff said that basically the economy is um, is doing better than expected, right? And then also, um, I mean, basically the economy is doing decent, but we still have a long ways to go. So it kind of basically said that, I mean, investors sometimes don't really use common sense, to be honest, but I guess we, we have to make sense out of some of the stuff they do. So it makes sense that if interest rates go up, it increases the demand for bonds and decreases the demand for stocks. That means stock prices go lower, bond prices essentially, in a way there's an inverse relationship, it's a bit complicated to explain. Um, but basically, the stock market would go down if interest rates go up. As interest rates go down, the stock market goes up because people have more money to buy stocks and then also the competitors, the bond market would be down because the price of the bonds wouldn't be that much, right? So it's kind of weird a little bit. Sorry for the background noise. Almost seems like something's going on every day in Uptown. Um, love Uptown, by the way. I think it's a great place, but it's a lot of sirens and all that good stuff. Hopefully nobody's house is on fire. Um, but with that being said, let's talk about last Thursday. Last Thursday, equities could not follow up on the prior day's gain.
tech shares plunged and the treasury yield soared to a one-year high as rising interest rates attracted bond buyers driving prices lower. The Nasdaq fell 3.5%, second only to the Russell 2000, which plummeted 3.7%. So, man, last Thursday was terrible. It was terrible. The S&P 500 dropped 2.5%, Nat the Dow 1.8%, and then the Nasdaq dropped 0.6%. Horrible day. Why? It's always important to understand why things happen, by the way. Just because the stock market went up or down doesn't mean anything if you don't understand the reason why. The reason why the stock market went down because the 10-year treasury surged past 1.5% because there was an increased demand for bonds for whatever reason because they thought that since the Federal Reserve chairman came out and on Tuesday and basically said interest rates might go up they got happy and bought a bunch of bonds um, because they were expecting their interest rates to go up then of course Wednesday he came back and said no 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 that's not what I meant right we meant that interest rates will stay flat they won't go up and so the stock market went up. Then Thursday, I'm like, ah, we change our minds a little bit. As you can see, there's no common sense that's being used here. It's just going off emotions, going off what people say. There's no real driver behind the stock market nowadays outside of companies like Apple producing iPhones and Amazon selling everything in the world. Outside of that, the stock market doesn't really make a whole lot of sense from a price, a daily price fluctuation perspective. From a long-term perspective, it makes a ton of sense that stock prices tend to go up because inflation prices go up, things of that nature. Um, but the fact that we have these big swings each day doesn't make any real sense. Like Reddit and GameStop somehow pulled down the market in a few days. I mean, it's, the stuff doesn't really make any sense from a day-to-day -day standpoint. From a long-term standpoint, yeah, the Reddit people, the GameStop people, they'll, they'll get crushed all day, every day. But from a short-term standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. And that's why I don't do day trading. That's why I don't do um, basically playing around with the, the short-term of the stock market. I'm in it for the long run because I know my money will grow up, will grow over the long term, over 100 years. A dollar today, a hundred years from now, I guarantee you would turn into two hundred. It's guaranteed, a hundred percent certainty. A dollar today is going to turn into two hundred dollars in a hundred years from now. It's guaranteed. As a matter of fact, it might turn into four hundred. There's a thing called inflation, the diminishing purchasing power of your money, aka your money. In a way, if it's invested, it goes up in value because it's actually doing something. When your money's just lazy sitting in a bank, lazy money makes no money, by the way. When your money's just sitting lazy and it's quote-unquote safe in the bank, it does absolutely nothing for you but actually costs you more money. But when your money is working hard, just like you're working hard, then that's where you make more money. It takes money to make money. When your money is sitting lazy, when the bank gets the money, they go to the Federal Reserve and they take, they borrow 10 times your money, that same dollar, they get $10, and the Federal Reserve is giving it to them at 0% interest, and then they turn around and give it back to you in the form of a credit card, and you don't even know it. You just got robbed, basically. Right? That's called financial awareness. That's called financial literacy. Um, so... Nothing wrong with banks. I love banks, but just keep your eyes open. Know what you're doing. All right, so let's um, let's talk about Friday. What happened in the stock market on Friday? And we just we got about five more minutes until we get into our topic today, which is about building multi generational wealth. All right, so last Friday stocks closed mixed last Friday, with only the Nasdaq and the Russell 2000 posting gains. Long-term treasury yields and crude oil prices fell while the dollar gained against a bucket of currencies. Consumer Discretionary and Information Technology, or IT for short, were the only sectors to gain. Energy, financials, utilities, real estate, and consumer staples each fell more than 1.5%. Overall, stocks closed the week and the month of February lower 
Each of the benchmark indexes essentially lost value, headed by the tech stocks of the NASDAQ. So NASDAQ is composed of big tech stocks. Then, ultimately, followed by the Russell 2000, S&P 500, and then the Global Dow. Um, the Dow, then the Global Dow. Treasury yields, the dollar, and crude oil prices advanced, while gold fell. Among the sectors, only energy, which went up 4.5%. Utilities, consumer discretionary, fell 5 and 4.9%, respectively. All right, and then let me see here. Okay, I don't know who this is. All right, yeah. So they ultimately fell down four point nine percent, and then year to date, each of the indexes essentially remained ahead of their um, respective twenty twenty closing values. So the stock market is still up for the year. No need to panic. No need to worry. Um, led by the small caps of the Russell 2000, followed by the Global Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, and the Dow. All right. So just to recap, so far this year, the Dow Jones is up 1.06%. NASDAQ is up 2.36%. S&P 500 is up 1.45%. And man, Russell 2000 crushing it up 11.45%. The Global Dow is up 5.17%. Looks like global tax, global stocks are actually recovering. Federal funds interest rates are at a measly 0%. Ten-year treasuries are at 1.46%. And what to look for this week? Shout out to the stock market for going up. And shout out to Congress or the um, basically the House for passing the third stimulus package. The $1.9 trillion. Yes, trillion with a T trillion dollar stimulus package that was big right there for sure um a few things to look forward to this week the employment figures for february and out this week are out this week january saw only forty nine thousand new jobs added while the unemployment rate remained at high at 6.3 percent holy cow everybody's filing for unemployment i mean why would they if they're giving out so much money in unemployment i mean a lot of this stuff it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, you would think it's common sense, but of course the word common needs to be erased from sense because I think it's disrespectful to put the word common in front of sense. Um, clearly, they're not using a lot of it right now. But on the plus side, average hourly earnings advanced 5.4%. Um, four to 12 months ended January 2021. All right, so let's talk about building multi-generational wealth. Here's a bonus while saving money for taxes. You didn't probably couldn't catch that part or you didn't see that part coming. So we, we've got to really find a way to build multi-generational wealth. Not just generational wealth, but multi-generational wealth. Meaning your kids, your kids' kids, their kids' kids, and then their kids' kids. That one life insurance policy, that $100,000 life insurance policy, that can take care of not only the funeral but also take care of the kids' college education, take care of um, some expenses, at least get them going on the right foot. So by the way, if you don't have a life insurance policy and you have a kid, you're doing something terribly wrong. It doesn't matter how much money you're making every year, but to leave your kids on this planet and not have any life insurance, life insurance, you can get it for as little as $20 a month. I know for a fact, everybody listening right now, your phone bill is more than $20 a month and you're on my Facebook Live right now. You're on my Instagram Live. So if you don't have life insurance and you have a child or a dependent, somebody you care about, I mean, that that's a mistake. I'll go as far as to say it's pretty selfish that you can have car insurance before you have life insurance. I think the priorities just needs to be shifted. Right? It's your own money. You can do whatever you want. I can only share my own opinion, expert opinion. But for somebody to not have life insurance and they have kids, that's like saying, I don't care about the kid. Basically, because what if something happened to you today? <laughs> you know, What happens to the kid? Have you thought about that? So quick plug to Badu Life and Health Solutions. It looks like my wife, beautiful wife, Yvonne, is um, with us today. 
And basically, yeah. You know, shout out to Badu Life and Health Solutions LLC where we can help you find the right life insurance products for you, your family, and your business. Um, but that, basically, that's like, that's part of the foundation. One of the ways the quote-unquote rich, I mean, there's this, um, this sort of negative connotation towards quote-unquote the word rich. But everybody seems to be working hard. Everybody seems to be striving for money. But when you hear the word rich, it's like, oh, you know, those guys. Um, and so I think in general, a lot of this stuff is just changing your vocabulary, changing your, your, the way you think about certain things, changing the way that you are going about certain things. Because if you're always thinking, oh, let's, let's go against them, let's do that. I mean, you've got to mind your own business, first of all. Minding your own business means that you're focused on your business. You're focused on your growth, your development. You're focused on you. You're focused on growing. That's what it means to mind your own business. And by the way, if you haven't read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad, shout out to Robert Kiyosaki. You probably should. It's one of the best books that I've ever read in my life. And it truly, truly, truly changed my life for the better. Going from one business to 12 businesses. Going from one in a thousand clients to five thousand clients, right? It just, it just expands your mind even more, essentially. All right, it just expands you, expands your mind even more. But one of the ways the rich keep getting richer is because they continuously build wealth on a multi generational basis. Right, their, their kids learn how to start a business at the age of like six or seven. Or eight or nine, whatever it is. They were put on a payroll. Right? They were they had life insurance that allowed them to get through school. Now think about what it would mean for you had your parents did the same for you. And no fault ever to the parents, by the way. You don't know better until you know better. You can't do better until you know better. But if you, do know, if you do know better and you don't do better, then shame on you. If you're listening today and I'm telling you that life insurance is probably something you might get to protect. It is a wealth building tool. We have different segments for that. It is a wealth building tool, but at a bare minimum, protect your family. And you're still saying, oh, I don't care about the kids. Then shame on you. Right? I can only do so much. That's why I started off the show saying... I can only help the super hungry, those who are extremely determined, extremely motivated, and they're looking to really get something done. So they keep getting wealthier, right? You might have heard that COVID-19, a lot of the wealth got shifted to the wealthy. Even more, the wealth gap just keeps growing more and more. Why is that? Because the wealthy do wealthy things. The non-wealthy do non-wealthy things. The wealthy do things like buy assets that generate them income. The non-wealthy do things like buy liabilities and take away income. Right? It, it's, it's all here, mindset. Success is really 80% mindset. 80% mindset. If you have the right mind, I mean, you can do whatever you want, basically. You can do all the good things you want. You just need to execute the other 20%. Right, so basically, they just keep, they keep, they're, they're, there's habits, habits, habits are very important. If you want to be successful, you need to have good habits, right? Good habits, a strong work ethic, a consistent work ethic. That's a good habit. Getting good sleep at night, eight hours of sleep, that's a good habit. Working out three days a week or even four days a week, that's a good habit. Right. Meditating, that's a good habit. Minding your own business, that's a good habit. You know, there's so many good habits that you put in place, but the wealthy just keep building good habits. That's why they keep all the money. Right? They keep all the money because they have good habits. And they're not necessarily, they're giving away to charity and all that, but they're not about to give it to anybody else. I mean, they might in the form of the charity that they're given to and all that stuff. But, I mean, they're like, if I just give, if you just give a man a fish, he just eats for one day. 
if you teach him how to fish, he eats for the rest of his life. Right? And that's the purpose of the Badu Foundation, by the way, to teach men and women how to fish. We don't just give you the fish. We teach you how to fish. They teach their kids how to build wealth early. And they can also utilize their kids for tax deductions, tax write-offs. Ain't nothing wrong with kids at all. You know? Kids are great. Nothing wrong with kids. They can help you with certain things. You can help them. You can build a legacy. They can build their own legacy. Kids are great. Nothing wrong with them. And these write-offs are far more than what the average person can deduct. As we're building wealth, we should aim to teach our kids wealth building principles along with ensuring that we leave a lasting legacy. Not just a legacy, but a lasting legacy. When you go to the grave, you go alone. Nobody joins you. On your tombstone, it only has your name on it. What do you want to be remembered for if today was your last day? That's the question everybody should be asking themselves right now. What do you want to be remembered for if today was your last day? Is it that you help people? Is it that you left your family with a good amount of wealth? Or is it that you left your family with this big bill, this funeral bill? This big student loan debt? You left kids that didn't have anything. I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. All right, so what do you want to be remembered for, basically? That's the question you should be asking yourself every single day when you wake up. That is truly, truly the question of life. What do you want to be remembered for when it's all said and done? Because you know the world will continue even without you, no matter what. Michael Jackson, rest in peace to his soul, the world continue without him. But... He still makes a lasting legacy, impact. Every time you go on YouTube right now and you type in the word thriller and you click play and an ad pops up, guess who makes money? Michael Jackson's estate, absolutely. That's a lasting legacy. That's what you call money on top of money on top of even more money. That's what you call kids, 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 and then more kids. 5,000 years from now, we'll still be wealthy living off a YouTube um, revenue source. That's what you call a, a lasting legacy. The word root word is lasting. So one thing you can do if you want to leave a good legacy on the planet is hire your kid in your company or in your business. Nowadays, a lot of people own small businesses. As a matter of fact, there's no reason why anybody listening to this today there's no reason why you shouldn't have a small business. I mean, the way the government is handing out the money, I kid you not, they are handing it out. They're just giving it. Like, hey, you want some? Here you go. By the way, they just changed the rules for the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program Loans, to allow Schedule C filers to use gross income. <laughs> gross income, top line revenue instead of net profit. When I saw this change, I was like, wait a second. Am I dreaming? I thought I was dreaming for a second. You're telling me that you're allowing me to get a PPP loan based on my gross income. So gross income now divided by 12 times 2.5 if I have a 2019 tax return. Schedule C. It's insane. We're doing a lot of webinars this week on a topic if you're interested. There's one on Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. And we'll send that out. If you're on our firm's newsletter, you'll get the invitation. If you're not, go to badutaxservices.com, B-A-D-U, taxservices.com. Please subscribe to the newsletter. It's going out tomorrow, so if you're not on the list, you won't get it. Um, but we will be sharing information about that. Nowadays, we do things a bit more private, just to have a more private audience. You know, So subscribe to the newsletter. Check out the event. We'll go through the details, the calculations, all you need to know. It's real simple. If you have a tax return that shows a Schedule C as of 2019 and you have a number in your gross income, 
which everybody who has a Schedule C has a number in their gross income, or they should, then you qualify for the PPP loan. Basically, that's every small business owner. That's not an S corporation or C corporation. So we'll talk about that when we get there. But hire your kid in your business. Remember that the rich pay very little in taxes. In some cases, no taxes. Warren Buffett pays less percentage of taxes as his own assistant. Because he, when he gets money, he reinvests it. He gets it, reinvests. Gets it, reinvests. He never lets money sit in the bank being lazy and just sitting there. He buys real estate. He buys companies. He buys assets that generate income. I had a call with a client today. She asked me, how do you save money on taxes? How can we reduce our tax liability? You need to buy assets that produce income, such as real estate. How do you save money on taxes? How can I legally pay zero dollars in taxes? You buy assets that produce income. It's real simple. <laughs> it's really, really simple. If you leave money sitting in the bank, it gets taxed. Because here's the thing, it's lazy. They should be taxing you on that money because you're not doing anything with it. If it's just sitting at the bank, just being lazy, and it's just sitting there, yeah, you should be taxed. It's not doing anything. Why shouldn't somebody come and take it? And trust me, somebody's going to take it, whether it's the bank, whether it's, um, whether it's a creditor, whether it's you putting, reinvesting money into your own business or your own self. Somebody's going to take that money. It's not really your money, to be honest. That's just somebody who paid you to get a service done and then it's going to circulate somewhere. It's going to end up in somebody's pocket. So that's the thing with money. It's just a tool that recirculates itself all the time. Like, you shouldn't really be worried about how much money you have in a bank. You should be worried about how much income you're collecting, how much cash flow is coming in every single month. That's what you should be worried about. Not money in the bank, it's cash flow. All right, so when they start a company, when I say they, I mean the rich, they can utilize their kids for tax benefits. You too have access to the same thing. Hire your kids and put them on payroll. Let's say you have a business. You own a hair salon. And in that, with that hair salon, basically, you're making, let's say, 50000 in a year. And you spend twenty thousand. So the money amount of money that's in your bank account is thirty thousand. Well, if you want good use of that money, hire your child and pay them a salary of twelve thousand dollars. The benefit is you get to deduct the twelve thousand dollars and they don't pay any taxes on the twelve thousand. You just robbed Uncle Sam, legally, of course, of twelve thousand dollars of taxable income. You hire your child. It's real simple. You have a business, you got a child. You hire that child, as long as they're at at least the age of seven, typically age of seven, and then you assign a role to them. Hey, go take out the garbage each week, right? Clean the home office or send out mailers. Whatever you can find a seven-year-old to do, then you pay them a salary of $12,000, which you would have paid somebody else to do, maybe an assistant, You deduct it on your business tax return, and they don't have to claim it as income because the standard deduction is, you guessed it, $12,000. The standard deduction is an automatic deduction that you get on your income tax return where you don't have to pay taxes on up to $12,000. It goes up every year. So this is huge. You're like, well, how do I save money on taxes? Hire your kid. I mean, you're about to pay for daycare, you're paying for school and all that. Why not just hire them, put money into their bank account, and let them pay for the school, the daycare, the Roth IRA, the life insurance, the 529 college savings plan. This is a very powerful wealth building tool. There's no limit on how many kids you can do this for. You can have 20 kids. You can do this for those 20 kids. And there's some technicalities behind that, but I won't get into it. I just want to keep it simple. All you're doing is you have a business that makes money, 
right? That business hires the child. You have a child. Let's say, let's say that you're 30 years old and you have a seven-year-old. You hire that seven-year-old in your business. You give them a legal title, home office assistant. Um, let's see, office shredder or paper shredding assistant. I mean, whatever it is, make it fun. Make it nice and uh, make, make it buzzy. Kids love buzzy stuff nowadays. The child works maybe three hours, five hours, ten hours, however, however many hours you want them to work. You pay them, let's say, a thousand a month. Auto pay from your business account straight into their personal account. They get to, you get to deduct it on your business tax return. They don't have to pay any income taxes on it. And Barbara asked a question. If you invest in a property, do you recommend it under an LOC or your name? That's an easy one. Always in an LOC. Never in your personal name. You should never buy real estate in your personal name. You should never, ever, 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 ever buy real estate in your personal name. Unless you're getting started and then a month after closing, you want to make sure you get it out of your personal name into an LLC. Known as a quit claim deed. Q-U-I-T-C-L-A-I-M-D-E-E-D. Quit claim deed. You never buy real estate in your personal name. It is the biggest mistake you can make in real estate because you expose yourself to personal liability. If a tenant slips and falls and busts their head and they sue you, they can take the money now. They can take the building and they can take what you own personally. When you have an LLC, they can only take the building. When you have a land trust, they cannot take anything because a land trust cannot be sued especially if you're in a state like Illinois. So we got about, let's do about five more minutes. We'll end at 7.48. Let's just continue the discussion. If you have a question, please feel free. If you're on Facebook, type in a chat box. If you're on Instagram, type in a chat box. Once again, you're tuned in to Money Talks, where all we talk is money on WGHC LP 98.3 FM. And today we're talking about how to build multi-generational wealth while saving for taxes or on taxes and happy tax season by the way if you do need a tax professional to prepare your taxes then reach out to us at badu tax services.com b-a-d-u t-a-x-s-e-r-v-i-c-e-s.com badu tax services.com send us an inquiry send us a note let us know you want your taxes done we'll have a team member reach out to you and tell you all the next steps we now have a team of 30 people by the way so it's not just me and the firm. We're growing. We're expanding. Infinite Expansion. Check out the book, Infinite Expansion. How to Infinitely Expand Your Vision of Abundance on Amazon and also on my personal website, which is jeffbadu.com. So basically, just as a recap, the rich keep getting richer. And you too can fall in that category, by the way, by essentially doing things like hiring their kids in their business. They start a business, they hire the kid, pay them $12,000, the, the, um, the parent deducts it on their tax return, the business tax return, and the, the child doesn't pay any income taxes legally. Right? They don't pay any income taxes legally. This is teaching your child business principles early. Right, early. You're teaching them as early as seven years old. They basically have their own business at the age of seven once you hire them because you basically hire them as a contractor. Right? You you essentially are hiring them, you know, in, in the form of they get to do whatever they want with their own money. They can pay for daycare if they want with their own money. They can pay for child care. They can pay for a 529 college savings plan. They can pay for life insurance. They can pay for a Roth IRA. They can pay for anything. Now you can pay more if you want. You 
can pay them more, but then they start paying taxes on anything above 12000 So we got a question here. Let me lean in on Facebook. And if you have any questions, just reach out to me after, after we're done here as well. But trying to understand a little clearly. So if planning to pass down multiple properties, put them all under their own separate land trust, yes. Um, so you would need to transition them out of LOCs. Well, you close in the land trust, first and foremost, and then the beneficiary of the land trust is an LOC. So basically, land trust is best practice. Most lenders won't allow you to operate a land trust, so then you just go to LOC straight route. If they do allow you to do a land trust, then you put it in a land trust and make the beneficiary an LOC. So it's actually two, land trust and LOC. But if it's just an LOC, that's fine. You're still being protected. The purpose of the LOC is to protect you personally. The purpose of the land trust is to protect the property itself. Um, so let's wrap it up there. Definitely appreciate you guys for tuning in to WJC LP 98.3 FM. And we just talked about building multi-generational wealth while saving for taxes. My name is Jeff Badu, and I look forward to continuously delivering you all some content. Thank you.